Although the subject matter that I'm going to speak about uh, is depressing in some respects, I hope it is uh, intellectually enlightening as a way to explain the current intellectual climate that we see in uh, many institutions of higher learning that are not UFM and uh, many other government and policy-making institutions around the world. And I'm going to start by posing a something of a conundrum or paradox to you. Just based on what you know about the history of communism in the last century and a half, is there anything about it that could remotely be called successful? I don't see any takers on that. Is there anything about it that uh, benefited humankind? That even delivered on its promises? Promises that were made 150 years ago when it's first offered as a... Uh, new system of thought, a new way to arrange an economy. What do we see every time communism has been attempted? Genocide, economic ruination, death, destruction, a real-time failure of the Marxist system and practice. And yet, despite that failure, Karl Marx is everywhere. He continues to be one of the single most cited figures in all of the humanities and social sciences at the academic level, one of the most commonly assigned texts in universities and colleges is Marx's Communist Manifesto, far and ahead away from other classics. Large shares and growing shares of faculty at disciplines across the humanities and social sciences and increasingly other fields describe themselves as adherents of the Marxist system. Why? I'm going to pause at, at least a thought experiment here, and that is that Marxism likes to reinvent itself in ways that are often convenient to leaving its legacy behind and discarding that legacy. And I would say that that reinvention is often intentional, as you would too if you had a legacy of hundreds of millions of bodies economic ruination, starvation, genocide in your wake. But I want to explore that, and I want to explore it on an empirical term. First, we want to start with Karl Marx's framework, because I think this is important to understanding how Marxist ideas take hold in certain societies. What is the basic Marxist framework? Well, I've mapped it out there in a, a very simplified form. Marx starts from the observation that conflict and contestation over control of material resources, scarce economic goods, is the mechanism that drives history forward. And he says that contest will take place at any given age or time in society over control of the means of production. Resources are scarce and people fight against each other for control of those resources. And in so doing, they divide into classes, economic classes. This takes place in the, the classical orthodox Marxian framework. You have a proletarian class and a bourgeois that are locked in competition, locked in conflict in such ways that ultimately resolve in the proletariat's favor. Why? Because there are more of them. This takes place in the next stage of Marx's predicted course of history. Material conflict generates eventually a political revolution where the lower classes rise up and seize the means of production from the owners of capital. And that mechanism ushers in, finally, the intellectual transformation, wherein communism emerges as the new mode of production, the final stage of historical development. That's simple, what Marx offers as his explanation for the course of history. He even claims that this is scientific in nature. This is something that you can discern from laws of the universe effectively, those laws being observed patterns in conflict over material resources. As long as you accept the first step, the others follow from it. And that's the gist of Marxian theory of history. F.A. Hayek, who this theater is named after, challenged this with a very prescient observation in 1949. Great little essay called The Intellectuals and Socialism, 
And he asks the question, where do Marxist revolutions come from? He looks around and he notices something very interesting. Even though it proclaims itself as a mass popular movement of the have-nots rising up against the haves and revolutionary zeal and seizing the means of production, the real and observed Marxist revolutions that had occurred in the world up until that point invariably followed another path. They started with intellectuals, a very small group of intellectuals, theorists, persons who had, like Karl Marx himself, deduced a course of history and then set about to make it happen. And in so doing, it's never the working class movement that brings about the revolution. Rather, it's what later Marxist theorists called the vanguard, the vanguard of the intellectuals who are there to lead the working class movement, and Hayek will take a much more cynical thing, take on that. He'll say they're generally rabble-rousers, violent people, people who stage coup d'etats, and topple governments. Persuasion is very seldom in this, in this framework unless it comes at the end of a gun. I'm going to extend that even further. We'll fast forward a decade and a half to another economist, public choice founding thinker, Mansur Olson, who quantifies and models out some of the obstacles to a Marxian revolution from happening, starting from the same observation that Hayek noticed in 1949. It's always an elite group of intellectuals that seem to drive the coup forward rather than a mass popular uprising. Olson is going to say that Marxism is fundamentally a theory of collective action, and he's going to say it's a wrong theory of collective action. It's a theory of collective action premised on an identity, a collective identity of the working classes. But he's also going to say free ridership undermines the working classes from ever forming together with enough energy and zeal to wage the revolution that is promised by Marx. Simpler way of saying that, why would you pick up a bayonet and charge the owners of capital to seize the means of production in Marxian sense when you could watch a football game or have a barbecue or enjoy something about life. Why would you take that risk upon yourself? Very seldom would it ever happen. In fact, you can wait on other people to do it if indeed that was the collective goal of the working class, which Olson is also going to say, generally speaking, it is not. Olson comes to the conclusion that every Marxist revolution that we had observed up until that point in history had been a small band of violent zealots styling themselves as intellectuals, seizing power, seizing force by way of staging a coup d'etat. What we have done between Olson and Hayek is basically inverted the Marxian framework. Rather than a progression through history determined by material scarcity of goods and the contest over them, we always see Marxism in practice consisting of one, a small band of political revolutionaries who seize power through unscrupulous means. After seizing power, they engage in ideological legitimization of Marxist doctrine, moving it from their own ranks to the center of intellectual discourse into the mainstream. And from there, Marxist ideas spread either by force or propaganda or usually some combination of both. Very different mechanism. Ludwig von Mises, another Prussian observer of history, was aware of this mechanism and pointed it out as it applied to Karl Marx's life. This is from a 1953 lecture that he delivered where he pointed out very clearly in somewhat counterintuitive ways given Marx's stature today, but I'll show you some of my own work on this, that Karl Marx was not very well known in his lifetime. In fact, he remained practically unknown for the greater part of his lifespan among his contemporaries. And, and Mises is going to say that the other socialists of his age were men, for instance, such as Ferdinand LaSalle, whose life was cut short in a duel, but he was better known in Marx's lifetime. Marx, on the other hand, was more or less unknown. People neither approved nor criticized his te teachings. He simply died in 1883 in relative obscurity. This was the subject of a paper that I first presented here uh, a little over a year and a half ago at UFM on studying the effect of the Russian Revolution of 1917 on Karl Marx's intellectual reception in the world. I'll only show you the, the basic results there because they're going to set the stage for what I'm going to dig into deeper tonight, why has Marx persisted since this event. 
The gist of it is, if you look at the black line, that's the actual Google Ngram citation pattern of Karl Marx. In all books that have been scanned in the English language, we've also tested this in German and a few other languages, and you see similar patterns play out there. And you notice they're relatively low. They start as a point of relative obscurity. You bring in other authors, you find that is true in Marx's case. What we did is we used the Google Ngram database to assemble 226 other authors and use computer algorithms through statistical software to essentially match the citation patterns of other authors that were contemporaries or preceded Marx to Marx himself, and that's where you get the dotted line. Our test is something called a synthetic control. It basically means we are finding a synthetic counterfactual to the real Karl Marx. In other words, we're asking the question, using other people that matched his citation patterns until 1916, who continued on that pattern afterward? And does it diverge from Karl Marx? It turns out it diverges in a very sharp way in 1917. We have empirical validation of what Mises, Hayek, and Olson all essentially said and predicted in their theoretical assessments of Marxist doctrine. Marxist citations skyrocket after Lenin and the Bolsheviks put them on the map. I want to show you a chart here, though, that extends that across the entire 20th century because we see quite a divergence after 1917, and we can see subsequent years certain things of, uh, of interest are happening, and those are the ones that I want to explore. So you see that initial jump in 1917, but it continues to go up. You see another jump in 1946. What happened then? The Soviet Union descended across Eastern Europe. The fall of the Iron Curtain onto Eastern Europe. 1968 is interesting because it's more of an intellectual movement. It's the year of all the student uprisings, especially in the United States, but they spread to other parts of the world. Uh, intellectual leftism was very ascendant in the university system. Something else comes along in 1991. What happens? It's the fall of the Soviet Union. Marx suddenly is out of favor, or at least in less favor than he had been over the several preceding decades. And then we bring us forward to today, what's happened, Marx has rebounded. Three decades ago, I'm guessing most of you don't remember this because you probably weren't born yet. It makes me feel very old. I do remember it. I was a little child, and uh, I remember looking up and seeing on CNN that uh, the weird Soviet man was waving his arms around, and then the screen at the bottom said Gorbachev had resigned. This is uh, December 26, 1991 basically dissolved the Soviet Union. And this had come after two years of, of pretty much continuous unrest and destabilization, not only in the Soviet Union, but the Eastern Bloc. Uh, you had the fall of the Berlin Wall two years earlier in 1989. And you had successive waves of previously Soviet societies just crumbling away, going by the way wayside. And that, that was declared as a moment in history as the triumph of free markets over the Marxist system. We had tried and tested and subjected Marxist economics to extreme scrutiny in practice, and it had failed that test. One of the great intellectual battles of the 20th century had been won by free markets. Marxism was to go away. Where are we 30 years later? Notice I used the same newspaper, New York Times and the New York Times. 2018, they ran an article proclaiming, Happy birthday, Karl Marx, you were right. It was something of a theme. You see that in The Economist as well. Rulers of the world read Karl Marx. You see it in the Financial Times, why Karl Marx is more relevant than ever. And these have continued on a, uh, a pretty much uh, uh, straightforward basis in top newspapers, mainstream outlets ever since then. At the same time, Marx has resurged in the university system particularly in the United States, but you also see it spread across literature across the academic world. Why? We start to see this cycle play out. Who's heard that before or seen some version of this ar argument before? Just by show of hands. A Marxist regime fails somewhere, and what do they say? That wasn't true Marxism. That wasn't true socialism. 
They've redefined the Soviet Union as state capitalism in one version of it. They've redefined regimes that only five or ten years ago they were applauding, such as the Maduro-Chavez regime in Venezuela, as having deviated from the course of true Marxism and lost its way. Rinse, repeat, the cycle goes on. And this has been true of every dictator that I show on the screen there. I could go back to the founding of that dictatorship and find you a Marxist intellectual of extremely high repute in that era who associated him or herself with the respective regime and declared that it was the future and the future had arrived and Marx's system of thought would soon be vindicated in Cuba, in Venezuela, in Cambodia, in China, in the Soviet Union, in Eastern Europe, and across several aborted and failed attempts in Latin America. But they all end up in the same place. Oppression, genocide, economic ruination. And yet, Karl Marx is never blamed for any of this. If anything, his heirs today run from the intellectual legacy of all of these figures that their precursors and predecessors once praised and claimed as the future. I'm going to propose that this actually follows a pattern in U.S. academia, which spreads into global academia, because the top universities in the world tend to be concentrated in the United States, and ideas that are adopted there spread through other university systems. The first chart shows the ideological affiliation of university faculty in the United States over the past 50 to 60 years even. You start in the 1960s, and the left, which is shown in the blue line, is always the largest faction, but it's a relatively stable one. The political right is shown in gray, it starts a little bit below the left and continues along that trajectory and starts to decline as orange moderates initially increase, but then they also start to decline. At the same time, patterns in the general population do not match this chart, but something really interesting happens around the year 2000. The left starts to take off. The left starts to skyrocket. Faculty hiring shifts leftward in most universities. And in so doing, Karl Marx's reputation starts to recover from that blip when it dropped after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union, which leads us to today. You get books like this on Duke University Press and other literature that has spread, taking Karl Marx's ideas and works and inserting them into academic fields that he never would have envisioned. Because remember, Karl Marx styles himself as an economist, yet he's seen as a founding figure of sociology imported backwards. He's seen as a major figure of literature, of art, of law, even though these fields never dealt with him in his lifetime, which is really strange given that even before the Soviet Union occurred, Marx was a representative of a failed and broken economic system. We know this through analysis of his work that occurred in his lifetime and shortly thereafter. Well, in his lifetime, he's relatively obscure, barely noticed outside of radical left-wing intellectual circles. But among the few people that do start to pick up on him are the marginalists, a group of economists we'll talk about in a moment. But I want to walk through Marx's system real quickly, and we'll see how marginalism becomes triumphant and what it tells us still of today. Marx starts with the notion that value is derived from labor performed. Who's heard this? The labor theory of value. You perform work on something, you improve it. You've added value to it, and at least in theory, it's yours. Marx says if we accept that value derives from work performed, we can also see a conundrum emerging in the way that value is assessed in market systems and the way that workers are rewarded for that value. He says basically, Owners of capital extract the difference between a price that a good is sold at and the price that they pay the laborer. And this simple calculation, this simple form of subtraction, we refer to as Marxian surplus value. Surplus value by right belongs to the worker but is taken by the owner of capital and that is the source of the worker's exploitation. That is the source of his or her unease. That is the source of what eventually becomes the revolution. But what do we know about the labor theory of value? Is it right or wrong? 
It's wrong. It doesn't work. Why? Even in Marx's own lifetimes, economists were starting to question its premises. Now, if I were to ask every single one of you in the room, what kind of car, what kind of automobile would you like to buy? You'd have a different answer, right? And it'd probably be different than what your neighbor or what someone on a different row said. Why? Because you have different subjective preferences about what you want to consume. We also find that your subjective preferences are conditional on the moment that you make an economic decision, the moment you make an exchange. Water, you'd pay a lot more for water if you're in the desert and you're starving and thirsty than you would if you're just walking outside and there's water fountains all around. So the unit that you consume and the moment you consume it matters. That's determinative of value. So in 1871, two economists uh, simultaneously discover a solution to the problem of value that does not require labor. That's where we get the marginal theory of value. That's Carl Menger, the founder of the Austrian school in the first picture, and William Stanley Jevons, who's out of the UK, founds the UK marginalist school in the second picture. Almost simultaneously, as Karl Marx is still alive and writing, they undermine his entire system of value. It also turns out that Marx runs into a, an internal complication, an internal problem. It's referred to as the transformation problem. The gist of it is that labor is both a priced input and an output of economic exchange. You cannot plan an economy without knowing those two pieces of information simultaneously. Otherwise, you descend into a mathematical circularity. Central planning, therefore, does not work. This is discovered both by Marxist critics and other Marxists. And they have an oh, oh no moment, uh, particularly around 1906 was the final nail in the coffin on the transformation problem. Simultaneously, these two attacks discredit Marx well before Vladimir Lenin comes along. Lenin seizes power and gives a major surge to Marxian doctrine, but in so doing, he also begins to discredit the ideas that he is advertising. Why? Because he's a mass murderer. He comes to enforce his doctrine at the point of a gun, Millions die in his wake. And this becomes apparent even in the Marxist world. By the late 1920s, early 1930s, the Soviet Union is a very deadly place to live, especially if you disagree. So a Western tradition in Marxism emerges that starts to reinvent itself, starts to describe itself as separate from the Soviet Union. We refer to this as the critical theory school of thought, or sometimes the Frankfurt school of thought after the university at which it was situated. It's explicitly Marxist in doctrine, takes its name from the subtitle of Marx's famous book, Das Kapital, a critique of political economy. And it positions itself in contrast with what they call traditional theory. Traditional theory is what we think of as descriptive theory, empirical theory theories of science, what we see and what we aspire to in our universities. A critical theorist will say that they are basically a veneer for upholding the power structures, upholding the haves against the have-nots. And by critiquing it, the critical theorist is trying to discover hidden meanings, hidden understandings of what reinforces the power structure of society, what reinforces essentially capitalist exploitation, and what prevents the worker from seizing the means of production in the Marxian sense. The interesting thing, though, even though critical theory has tried to distance itself from the Soviet Union and subsequent Marxist revolutions, it got its start in 1923 in an homage to Vladimir Lenin. I'll give you the quote there. won't force you to read it in any, any particular length. But the gist of it, this was offered by Karl Korsch, a Western Marxist theorist, at one of the founding seminars of the Frankfurt School in 1923. And he sings the praises of Lenin and other similar revolutionaries who were less successful than Lenin in 1917 for having delivered an awakened Marxist theory and restored its revolutionary zeal from a period preceding it in which it was fading away into social democracy, being winnowed away and watered down. And Karl Korsch is full of enthusiasm about that zeal and passes it to the other Frankfurt School theorists. As I mentioned, the critical theory tradition takes root at the University of Frankfurt in 1923. 
It's originally partially funded by the Soviet government in the collaborative project, even as they tried to distance themselves. One of the major founding figures of that field, the person who coins really kind of the critical theory tradition and philosophy is pictured there, that's Max Horkheimer, uh, becomes one of three to four major figures that come out of the University of Frankfurt. But I want you to pay attention to the date. We're talking about the 1920s, early 1930s. There is a diaspora, which this institution is basically dispersed by World War II, and it relocates into portions of England and eventually the United States, sets up shop, and then after the war, some of them return to Germany. So that's an important year, 1923 and about the decade that follows. Because you'll notice, initially, these are the citation patterns of the major figures of critical theory and some of their students and adjacent scholars that emerge. They're basically non-existent in the era in which they're originally producing this. When do they appear? About 1968. That's when you see the first big surge in critical theory citations. They've moved in to the university system, capitalizing on the popularity of Marx that came out of Lenin from a generation prior and seem to be doing pretty well uh, thereafter. You've probably heard some of the names that are associated with this. Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, Herbert Marcuse are the three major co-founders of the original Frankfurt School. They have their own students, uh, one of which spikes in significant ways in uh, 1970, that's Angela Davis after she was involved in some terrorist attacks and then fled to the Soviet world from the United States. Uh, there are other simultaneous movements emerging. Uh, Paulo Freire, the critical pedagogy movement, is derivative of some of the same ideas, as are some of his students. Then you also see a parallel. Western Marxist theorist who had fallen into obscurity in his own time, but is rediscovered and reattached to the critical theory tradition in Marxism, that's Antonio Gramsci. It was an Italian revolutionary that basically attempted to precipitate his own Bolshevik uprising in Italy and the immediate aftermath of Lenin, was captured and imprisoned, died in prison, and left thousands of pages of notebooks and letters and writings about how Marxists needed to readjust their strategy. Critical theory has since skyrocketed and taken off in other ways in the U.S. university system and in academic citations worldwide. This is some brand new data that uh, just finished putting together this morning uh, with uh, one of uh, my colleagues at AIER. And this tracks the rise of critical race theory from basically its inception in the late 1980s at an academic conference, a derivative application of this branch of Marxist theory, all the way up until the 2010s. And what do you see? It initially starts very obscure. Then around uh, the mid-2000s, early 2010s, it starts to skyrocket. These are all normalized, so uh, even though their citation rates differ person to person, they are set to a baseline to where the initial year is equal to zero. And you can see their growth over that entire period. Critiques of traditional theory that come out of critical theory? The gist of their argument is that traditional theory, basically what we know is the scientific method, what we know is liberal analysis of economic events, what we know as uh, empirical social science, projects a false scientific neutrality a false objectivity, and the critical theorist claims the power, the ability to detect the falsity of these institutions and arguments by discerning and sniffing out power disparity that they claim to reinforce. Science services the haves at the expense of the have-nots. And this tends to privilege narrative as the alternative to science. I'll note that critical theory considers classical liberalism to be an explicit product of traditional theory and describes it as such, going all the way back to the writings of Max Horkheimer in the 1920s and 30s. And this is where you get some of the modern iterations where we critique the notion of the rule of law, we critique non-discrimination, we tr critique neutrality and colorblindness as really servicing institutions of power. It's an attempt to reorient the power dialectic, the struggle away from class identity, which had failed because it never materialized without intellectuals leading it, and toward other groups that can be mobilized as activist interests to bring about a Marxist society. Derivatives of critical theory are all around us. I just list some of the major ones there. 
including some of the figures we'll run through. You can find them taking place in taking root in all sorts of things from the humanities to the social sciences to law, art, critical theory of fine art. It's really kind of a strange thing. Marx never would have dreamed of that himself. And then in particular, several aspects of what we call post-colonial theory. They see critical theory precursors in older writers, such as W.B. Du Bois in the United States, and Franz Fanon as a major uh, post-colonial theorist uh, who is often seen as an analyzer of societies that were previously run by imperial regimes. What's the difference between traditional Marxism and critical theory? I argue it looks a lot like that. If you've ever seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail, or Monty, Monty Python and the Life of Brian, that's the one that's from. Uh, they agree on like 99.9% .9 of all their economic ideas, but uh, they think that each other is an incorrect interpreter of Marx, and so they will viciously fight each other to the end based on that. Nonetheless, we see a witness to the emergence of critical theory Marxism in the university system that explicitly attests to what modern critical theory Marxists deny, and that is a link to Lenin, a link to the Bolsheviks, a link to this event that put them on the map. That is Carl August Wittfogel, who was an attendee of that same seminar in 1923 where Karl Korsch gave his lecture and one of the founding figures of the Frankfurt School. He later ceases to be a Marxist. He turns on Marxism and observed in a 1960 le uh, lecture that if the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 had failed, Karl Marx today would be remembered by only a handful of social scientists and an ever-decreasing number of even socialists. Why? Because his theory had faced the test and failed, had not survived its academic and intellectual critiques. He, in fact, predicts this is going to become more rapid as communism's errors continue to emerge in the 20th century basically predicting what happened between 1989 and 1991. And yet, Marxism resurged. And it resurged, strangely, escaping some of the legacy that had previously been assigned to it. How so? Well, even though we've inverted the core order of Marxist theory in our analysis, it's no longer stages of history from material conflict to idea realization, as Marx would have predicted. Rather, we see a pattern of small bands of radical intellectuals engaging in violence and imposing Marxism from above. The critical theorists adopt a sleight of hand. And that sleight of hand is to assert that they are no longer or never were even associated with the legacies of Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and their many successors. That wasn't real Marxism always follows. One of my major purposes in doing empirical analysis of this question is to show that, yes, indeed, Marxism in its current course did follow from these violent events. And in fact, the critical theorists, the modern reinventors of Marxism, would never even have their existing system of thought, let alone presence in the university system, had it not been built upon the backs of Lenin, Stalin, Mao, and successive regimes that did use violence to impose their forms. Thank you.